Here we go. Welcome, a, uh, welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. The series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project with funds from the Exascale Computing Project. Uh, the series is a collaboration involving the United States Department of Energy, computing facilities at the Argonne Oak Region Nash Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley. Ashley from Oak Region I will be the hosts for today's webinar, Introduction to COCOS or the COCOS Ecosystem. Uh, and the webinar will be presented by Christian Trott from Sandia National Labs. Uh, Christian is a high-performance computing expert designing and implementing software for modern HPC systems. He, as I said, works at the Sandia National Labs, where he leads the COCOS core team developing the performance portability program model for C++ and heads Sandia's delegation to the C++ Standards Committee. Christian serves as an advisor to numerous application teams and help the teams redesign their codes using COCOS to achieve performance portability for the next generation of supercomputers. We have sold plus uh, more than 200 tickets for this webinar and all attendees have been muted. We will be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc that you can see the link on the screen. Uh, and the webinar will have breaks so the speaker, uh, Christian, can respond to the questions that come in. With that, Christian, please, Ashley, you give him the screen. Thank you. So everybody can hear me? Good. Um, so I'm going to talk about the COCOS ecosystem. This will be um, partly an introduction of you know what we're about. Uh, so this is something you know if you if you heard tons of talks of me, you know probably the first half or so of this will be fairly uh, familiar to you. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, you know what our plans are for the, the new upcoming Exoseal machines and uh, what we are going to do going forward uh, in terms of new things you know we are developing for uh, for cocos uh, obviously if you attended the cocos session at uh, the ecp meeting uh, just a couple weeks ago then a lot of that will also be not completely new to you okay so why do we care about uh, you know cocos or something like that the reason is that it, you know coding is actually a pretty expensive ex exercise there's this estimate that you know you, a professional developer can, a software developer can write about 10 lines of code per hour, so about 20,000 lines of code per year. And this is you know something coming out of like Google and Microsoft and you know all these industry uh, folks. Uh, and you know it means somebody who doesn't do anything else than coding, right? He doesn't write any reports, right? They don't you don't go to any ECP meetings or something like that, right? You don't write any papers. The only thing you do is you code. Uh, now. A very optimistic estimate, you know, you need to touch about 10% of your application uh, if you want to switch to a programming model. Say you go from, you know, CUDA to one ABI or something like that. Uh, and that's probably an optimistic estimate. Considering that most of our apps, you know, are somewhere between 300 and 600,000 lines for the big apps, um, then, you know, it would take you about two and a half men years, you know, just coding to switch over. And if you go to some of the larger scientific libraries, for example, like Trillinox, you know, that uh, escalates quite uh, quite soon. Now, the problem on top of that is that we have all these different machines under there, and all of these guys now want their own kind of programming model, right? Uh, in particular, the new Exascale machines. And uh, instead of now everybody doing that effort, you know, for every one of these machines, the idea is that everybody writes to Cocos, and uh, then Cocos maps that stuff to the underlying architectures. So what is COCOS? COCOS is a couple of things. It's a C++ programming model for performance portability, most and foremost. Uh, it's implemented as a template library, so it's written in C++. It sits on top of things like CUDA and OpenMP and you know now, now starting one API and HIP, etc. Uh, one of the core features of the programming model is that it aims to be descriptive, not prescriptive. So generally, you're going to tell us, you know, what you're trying to do, and we try to figure out, you know, what kind of mechanisms exist on the hardware you're compiling for to, you know, get you the best result. Uh, and another big thing point is that we are trying to align with the developments in the C++ standard. Uh, the COCOS team 
had at the last two meetings something like seven or eight people who are involved in the COCOS development. Um, so that puts us just one step behind NVIDIA and Bloomberg in terms of being the biggest contingent at the C++ comma team. Besides the programming model, COCOS is also this expanding solution for you know, stuff you need for science and engineering codes. Uh, it's not enough to just have a programming model. You know, at some point you're going to ask, oh, you know, how I want to call a matrix matrix multiplier or a sparse matrix vector multiplier or something like that. You know, I want to build a solver. How do I do that? Right? Do I have to write everything else, um, on my own? Uh, and no, the answer is you don't, uh, because we have already math libraries based on Cocos, which are available to you. And the other thing you're going to need is, you know, you're going to need things like debuggers, profiling, etc., and potentially tools which actually know about COCOS, and that's what uh, the COCOS Tools project is about. Um, COCOS itself, all of these parts are open source. It's maintained in the github.com COCOS organization, and we have tons and tons of users from all kinds of places. So in the ecosystem, there is uh, a numerous parts. So the core part is this programming model, right, with parallel execution and parallel data structure. On top of that, we have COCOS kernels, which is linear algebra kernels and also graph kernels and stuff like that. And then we have COCOS tools, which provide like debugging, profiling, and in the future, now tuning. And then we have this other side of a project where we have explicit funding for COCOS support, which develops like documentation, tutorials, boot camps, and stuff like that. A couple of new things coming in is remote spaces that will give you uh, you know, kind of the equivalent of uh, global race, as well as potentially I.O. via COCOS views. And then from the uh, Lawrence, uh, Los Alamos site, we have the COCOS Fortran interoperability library, uh, which is kind of cool. And if you want to know more about that, you know, then contact us later. Uh, the COCOS development team has been growing quite a bit, in particular in the last half year or so. Uh, we have now core developers at uh, at five or six of the uh, at five of the big national labs at Los Alamos, Sandia, Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Berkeley, uh, as well as some contributors at the Swiss Supercomputing Center. And uh, you know, there's about uh, 16, 17 people who are contributing to the core library right now. There's another, you know, six, seven. Uh, who contribute to kernels, and then uh, some people to tools and for support. Okay, um, are there any questions so far? I don't know if it's there. Yes, Christian, one just came in here. Is the PGAS space av available for experimentation? Yeah, it is. Uh, currently, it's still in the private repo on GitHub. We can make give access to that. Uh, the, it's, it's in very early stages. We are trying to probably make it public as an experimental capability in the next, like, six weeks or so. Okay. okay thank, thank you. Um, so on the core programming model, uh, the heart of what COCOS is is these uh, abstractions. And there are, there are two sets of abstractions here. One is for data structures and one is for parallel execution. Uh, the parallel execution abstractions, that's kind of what you have in most of these programming models, right? You, you have things like execution spaces, you know, like a way of saying, oh, this should execute on the GPU, this should execute on the CPU, et cetera. Um, you have um, you know, execution patterns, essentially the kind of structure you give your code, you know, like a parallel loop, a parallel reduction, a scan, you know, task graphs and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's the execution policies, which essentially control how you execute these patterns. Uh, you know, there's things like the, in COCOS, things like the range and the team policy or task graph, et cetera. Uh, you know, other things which go in there are things like, you know, do you do dynamic scheduling or static scheduling, et cetera. Uh, and that's something, you know, if you, if you squint, you know, you can see that in CUDA and OpenMP and stuff like that. Um, what's the, a bit more elaborate on the COCOS side is the data structure thing. On one hand, there's the memory spaces. And in COCOS, memory spaces are, uh, you know, not, not just like host and device, but in principle, they are uh, kind of any kind of memory space. And you can have, you know, multiple of these guys in, in, in any given hardware. And it also encodes uh, 
certain uh, semantics of the memory space. So, for example, the unified memory space on uh, NVIDIA platforms is a different uh, memory space than the one where you just allocate on the, on the GPU and it's not accessible to the CPU. Uh, in, in innovation in Cocos was the memory layout. And that is essentially the recognition that uh, data access patterns are key to get you know, performance portability, but that data access patterns have to be different on different architectures. And uh, that's where the memory layouts come in. So in our data structures, which are templated on the memory layouts, you essentially just by changing the type def, can, you can change how your logical, your algorithmic indexing maps to linear memory addresses. And that allows you to change the, uh, the, the access patterns of your algorithms just by changing type depth instead of just instead of rewriting your whole code. Uh, a last thing there is the memory traits, and that is something you can attach to uh, these data structures. And that expresses things like you want atomic access, you want like a restrict access, uh, and other kind of you know special kind of data access paths in the hardware. Uh, so how do these core capabilities kind of look like? This is just a really tiny overview of what's in there. Um, you know, the first most simple thing would be something like a parallel four. Uh, you just give it a number of, uh, number of uh, iterations. You give it a, a loop body via a lambda, via C++ lambda, and then it will execute. And it will execute on the default execution space, you know, with kind of all, all things defaulted. Uh, there's parallel reductions. You know, you can just put there a parallel reduction, and you need to uh, tell it, you know, at the end of a parallel reduction, as the last argument, what kind of reduction operation you want. Uh, in this case, as the example I have here, also uh, oh, I can't highlight. Oops. Um, also put explicitly a range policy in there. This range policy execution space zero n is essentially the same as uh, just giving an n if you had. Uh, its exec space is actually the default execution space. But by putting there something else, for example, saying I want the default host execution space, you can control where this thing executes. There's tightly nested loops that's in particular important for uh, for things like uh, for things like uh, structured grids, where you can uh, it's essentially the equivalent of an OpenMP collapse, where you say you know I have like three or four or five or whatever many tightly nested loops. And your loop body will just get the three indices. Uh, it allows tiling. So in this case, you know, I gave it the three start indices, zero, 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 you know, the length in each dimension, and one, and two, and three, and also tiling, uh, uh, tiling information about, you know, how big to make tiles. A really important thing for a lot of our apps is non-tightly nested loops. So if you don't have, you know, if you have code in between these new uh, um, loop nestings, you still want to parallelize, you know, uh, multiple of these loops because you may not have enough parallelism on the outer, on, on you know, just one loop level. And that's what the tightly nested loops are for. And basically, they work the exact same way as the outer stuff, you know, you just use different policies. Whereas task graphs, uh, I'm not talking too much about where the, the data allocation where it's, uh, you know, our Cocos view with, with the layouts and the memory spaces, et cetera. Um, Data management is generally explicit, so you do deep copies explicitly. You can do atomics. You can do atomics on even uh, arbitrary types, so you can do it on like complex double and stuff like that, on all the architectures. And then there's the different execution spaces. Uh, there's tons of other capabilities I'm not going to go into. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a simple example of a conjugate gradient uh, solver. As you know, to give you a, a look and feel of how it looks like to write uh, to write Cocos code, and uh, we start with we start with uh, you know something which is kind of uh, which is coming out of MiniFE. So there's essentially just three math operations in this thing. There's a vector addition, a dot product, and the sparse matrix vector multiply. Uh, but before we go there, you know, the first thing we need to do is we need to do uh, like our data management, right? And uh, the way this works in this case is that, uh, you know, say, say you get uh, your original data from outside, 
uh, you can actually wrap that, right? So X in could be like a double star point, uh, you know, just a double star pointer. And you can wrap that, you say explicitly this is on host space because the data you got from somewhere else in your app was probably, you know, allocated just with new or malloc or whatever. And the unmanaged says, I'm not, uh, not going to own this data, I'm not going to free this data, you know, uh, because I, you just handed me a pointer. Uh, when I allocate a view in the default memory space, which then depends on whether you compile for GPUs or for CPUs, you know, where, where that sits. And I'll deep copy, you know, the data in. So the first loop would be, uh, you know, the simple data pro loop for the XP. Since it's just a data pro loop, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing particular uh, interesting going on here. Uh, we can just use like a Cocos Pro 4. This is super easy to express in most programming models. Uh, the one which is probably the most annoying right now is uh, OpenMP target because you have to do all these map clauses. Uh, this kernel is benzos bound, so you know if you don't get a decent performance on any of the programming models, you know then something is wrong. But uh, you know it should be simple enough. So serial implementation of this kernel, you know how you would find it in many applications would be just, you know, an XP, you give it the number of elements, uh, you give it the three pointers and maybe an alpha and better, and then you run that loop, and you, you just run through that. So uh, how, does that, how does that look in Cocos? What you would do is you replace the pointers with views. Uh, in this case, I told explicitly that uh, the X and Y are const, because, you know, they are just read, not modified. And then the loop is replaced with a parallel 4. In this case, I gave it also a name, which is really useful for uh, debugging and profiling purposes. I told it, you know, n as the number of uh, number of iterations. I gave it this Cocos Lambda that kind of just hides some nastiness in the programming model, like, for example, these host device annotations you need for CUDA. Uh, the Lambda just takes an integer in, and then, you know, you essentially have the line as before. Uh, the only thing I replaced here is the, uh, the, no, the uh, brackets with like parentheses. So far, so good. Uh, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna go on. Yeah, no, oh, good. So what's a bit more interesting is the, is the dot product. Uh, so it's essentially a simple data parallel loop, but it does a reduction over all the elements. So what you want is you want the Cocos Pro reduce. Can I click that away? Sorry. Um, in one of the problems with that is that that is actually pretty non-trivial in CUDA due to the lack of built-in reduction support. So there isn't actually like in CUDA, in the core, core programming model, anything to do that. You kind of can do that now with, um, or you can do that now with Thrust, though. Uh, it's also generally Benzos bound, uh, and the serial implementation, you know, would look relatively straightforward. You just get two pointers, you get an n uh, number of iterations, uh, you create a temporary, and you plus equal into the temporary. Now, in the Cocos implementation, you also get, uh, you get to get two views. You tell it that, you know, the temporary where you want the result. And then you can call parallel reduce. I gave it, uh, which is the you know loop pattern with a reduction. Uh, I gave it again a name and the number of iterations. And now the thing which changed here is the uh, is the uh, the signature of the lambda. I just I don't just get the integer for the loop index. I also get like the thread local reduction variable uh, there. That is something interesting. If you actually parallelize that upper loop, the serial implementation of OpenMP, the compiler will do for that. So the sum inside the loop would actually be a different variable than the sum outside of the loop, and it would be a different variable for every thread. Since you don't write a compiler which magically changes stuff for you under the hood, uh, we have to make you pass that thread local variable uh, in. We allocate that on our side instead of parallel reduce, and then pass it to your lambda. Okay. Um, now, the most interesting one of these is the, oh, there was a question. Oh, um, there's a question of how does labeling the operations help me? Um, 
I'm actually coming to that a little bit later when I'm coming to the tools section. Uh, basically, we can provide that information to things like profiling and tuning and debugging tools. And uh, I'll, I'll show an example of that later. And that's kind of super helpful because otherwise you get uh, in the profiling tools these super, super weird uh, uh, type IDs as the names for your, for your CUDA kernels or your loops or whatever. But I'll show an example of that later. Okay. Um, sparse matrix vector multiply. What you do in that operation is you loop over the rows of a matrix, uh, and then you do a dot product of a matrix row with a vector for every one of these rows. Uh, it is an example of a, uh, of a non-typey nested loop because you write, you have to write the result of that inner uh, of that inner dot product back to the uh, Back to the um, yeah, uh, to a left hand side vector. Um, and there's one more thing you do random access on the x vector because you uh, use this column index coming from the matrix to index into that, uh, into that vector. We'll see that here. We go over the outer loop over the matrix rows. We do the inner dot product row with the x vector. And yeah, that's kind of it. Now, this version here is, looks obviously quite a bit more complicated. Uh, the reason that it looks so complicated is that this is actually a really good implementation of a sparse metric. And that's actually an implementation of a sparse metric which has been beating things like QSparse and MKL uh, you know, on a wide range of uh, matrices. Uh, and that is actually what we use in Trillinos, pretty much. So what's going on here? The first thing is we start team parallelism over row work sets. So what we did is we said, you know, we want uh, we we figure out via some heuristic how many rows we uh, we give to each like team of threads, and then uh, each team will essentially handle one of these row work sets. Uh, within that, we do a, a loop over over all, over all the row. Uh, over all the rows within that row work set and parallelize over the threads within the team. And then the last thing is we do a vector level reduction for, uh, for each row, you know, within, uh, within each thread of the uh, focus team. In some sense, you can think of that as, you know, you, you uh, on, on, for example, KNL, you would say, oh, I'm using like a team size of four, so I give row work set to uh, hyper threads on the same core, in the assumption that if you know I have like my uh, sorted my rows nicely, then uh, consecutive rows will access kind of the same cache lines, the same, uh, the same, or at least the same pages. Uh, and you parallelize over these row work sets, you know, with the hyper threads within the core, so that they collaborate on using the same cache. And then you use vectorization to uh, vectorize the inner loop. On on GPUs, what you would do is you would give uh, you would give a row work set to like a CUDA block, then you parallelize, say, with the, uh, you give each row to a warp and you use the warp level parallelism to uh, do the, uh, uh, the, the innermost reduction. There's one more trick here for GPUs. Uh, by telling us that this, uh, this X vector will be accessed with like random access, uh, we're enabling texture fetches here. Which is kind of neat. Um, this performance comparison is a little bit older, uh, in particular the OpenMP numbers. I wouldn't like. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't like take them too seriously. On the other hand, uh, uh, I also didn't get better numbers out recently, so I don't know. But this does is essentially a comparison with other programming models. Uh, this is. I'll answer it in a second. Uh, the, what this does is essentially comparing like different programming models, right? So we compared OpenACP with a raw CUDA with a Cocos implementation and an OpenMP offload implementation uh, on P100 and Power8. Uh, and we ran two different problem sizes. So one of the problem sizes is 100 by 100 by 100, so you have like 1 million rows, uh, and the 200 by 200 by 200, uh, which gives you like 8 million rows. And 
if you look at that, you know, generally Cocos is roughly on par with, you know, what the best model is. Sometimes it's a bit better, sometimes it's a bit worse. Uh, OpenMP has some weak points for some reason. Uh, on KNL, uh, we kind of know where it is coming from. It's a bit weird. Uh, on the GPUs, it's basically immature compilers. Uh, and it really depends which compilers you're using. I think this was actually using the, uh, the Clang mainline compiler. XL is, is supposed to be better usually, in, uh, but uh, it, uh, XL currently uh, doesn't compile our backends or, or doesn't compile all the code uh, and uh, crashed on this code, even on the native OpenMP code I implemented here for some reason. Um, and then, yeah. Any questions to that? No. Okay. Well, Chris, Christian, there is a question here. Does Coco's data structures provide a persistence layer for HDF5 parallel or serial? So, not currently, uh, but actually there's a prototype out there. Uh, this is essentially as part of this remote memory space stuff. Um, there is, there's a prototype for kind of I.O. Uh, stuff via HDF5. And uh, we haven't productized that, but um, the idea is that it essentially is just exposed as a different memory space. And what you can then do is you can deep copy from that to a different view. And that would just copy from, you know, as a load the stuff from files into, into your stuff, into your data structures. But uh, if you're interested in that, uh, please contact me later and I get you in contact with the people who are working on this kind of stuff. Okay, go on. Oh, let, there is another one here coming in. Are OpenMP numbers for GPU or CPU? Uh, in the above panel, it's for uh, for the GPU, so that's on the P100, and in the below panel, it's for the kernel. Okay, go on, please. Okay, so Cocos kernels. Uh, that's one of the one of us, our math library, uh, uh, which we provide. Basically what it does is it does like blasts and sparse and graph kernels on top of Cocos and its view abstractions. Uh, generally it's scalar type agnostic. That means it works for any types which have the, the correct internal math operators. So if you want to do a vector add, right, you better have a plus operator defined. It's layout and memory space aware. So that means you can hand to Cocos kernels, you know, uh, like host views or device views or whatever, and it will figure out how to execute that correctly. It can call vendor libraries when available. So if you give us the correct data layouts, the correct scalar types and stuff like that, and the memory spaces matches, when we will call into things like MKL and, uh, and QSPARS and QBLAS and stuff like that. One of the nice things about that interface is that it's generally simpler than you know, the, the standard CBLAS interface. And the reason is that the views contain things like the size and stride information. So you don't have to give like half a dozen integers for all of it. You basically just provide, you know, the, the views, the, the scaling parameters, and the, you know, whether you want like uh, the, the transpose arguments. Uh, one other thing we are working on, and where we have quite a bit of stuff already done, is we have interfaces to call Cocos kernels at the team level. So if you think about back about this this nesting level, we have interfaces where you can call it at that level. That means you can, for example, call uh, a matrix vector multiply uh, within a CUDA block, you know, where the CUDA block will execute that one operation in parallel. Uh, if you think about, you know, current architectures, uh, a single SM on a, on a V100, right, gives you almost 100 gigaflops a second in, you know, uh, in throughput or double precision throughput. So that's already quite a bit of stuff, right? And then it can go up to 2,000 byte parallelism. Uh, so, you know, each of these individual ones is already a pretty hefty block, and uh, that means in a lot of situations we can, uh, you know, assign like work sets or work items to one of these things, but then need to do things like solvers in that. Uh, Cocos Tools is essentially our... Uh, our tool set, which provides things like profiling and auto-tuning uh, and debugging and stuff like that. Uh, the, the one which we had the most or the longest is the profiling stuff. There's new tools coming out all the time. 
and uh, we, you know, we work with vendors to make these tools more useful. Um, oh wait, there's more questions on the previous stuff. Let me go back for that. Uh, yes, I was going to read them for you. <laughs> but, I have it open here, so I can do that. Okay. Um, go, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the the fifteen that was that was probably that was probably uh last summer I would guess. So the numbers are probably better now. Uh the clang numbers are still horrible. So I actually try to, to reproduce this stuff with like just pure clang and uh the dot product is still like amazingly bad. The first time I run that I was a bit I thought like, oh everything is fine, you know, it's like you know, nine point something versus ten point something until I noticed that the units in Cocos were microsecond and in the open in the raw open MP implementation it was milliseconds. Uh so but XL is supposed to be better. So I would that's why I said, you know, I wouldn't trust these numbers too much right now. Um the other thing, uh does Cocos insert OMP SIMD uh when using a threat vector range? Um it doesn't introduce OMP SIMD, it does uh add like a pragma IV depth. Uh, and and the, uh, and the reason that we do that is that tons of our code actually gets slower when we put OMP SIMD in there, because the problem is that most compilers right now interpret OMP SIMD. You shall vectorize that no matter what your cost model says. And in particular on KNL, we ran into tons of trouble with that because it would inject, you know, arbitrary bad. Uh, code with like gathers and scatters, and it would actually be better to in, at, execute that in serial. So that's why we have the uh, IV depth right, in, right now in there. Um, we are considering changing that to Pragma OMP SIMD in particular on some of the newer hardware where we haven't seen the problems being that pronounced. And uh, so, yeah, it's a bit tough. Okay, uh, and the last question here, uh, it appears that Cocos kernels are based around fixed size matrices. Uh, no, Cocos view double star star is two runtime dimensions. Right? That's not that's not uh, fixed size. If you had like a Cocos view double star five, that would be you know one runtime dimension and one compile time dimension. And if you do something like Cocos view double five five, that would be all uh, compile time dimensions. Uh, so uh, the interface is doing runtime dimensions, or actually, what? But, yeah, there is a question coming yeah. in, and the speakers the waiting for it. No, it's it's not right. The, um, the Cocos kernels with the different element types, uh, it can take any element types. As we even in, in, we even like instantiate Cocos kernels with stuff like uh, you know automatic differentiation types, UQ types, and stuff like that, uh, and uh, and other things, uh, other things like that. Okay, or we can come back to that. Um, so. Uh, when we said that Cocos kernels is memory space aware, uh, the memory space awareness is essentially it, it recognizes what your views are, right? You allocate the stuff in HPM or whatever you want, and then Cocos kernels will execute in the execution space, which is the most appropriate execution space for the memory space you chose. So uh, it's not that it internally will do, you know, like uh, hidden deep copies, but it will, you know, honor whatever you chose to do. Okay, I'm going to go on now with the tool. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> the auto tuning, the auto tuning is something which is under development. Essentially, it will do things like uh, tune the internal variables such as such as CUDA block size, etc. But we will also provide an interface so that you can you can provide uh, you know variables and register with them with a kernel. You can say something like, oh, here's my tiling parameter or whatever my internal parameter and uh, please associate with the next kernel and give me a tuned variable back, something like that. It will do the same as profiling, 
uh, that means you can use those tools on your release executables. Uh, the way this works is that we deal open, uh, uh, we deal open uh, these tools and then essentially fill things like function pointers uh, based on uh, whether you loaded something. And uh, the overhead of, of having these, this capability in your release uh, uh, executable is something like a pointer comparison. So it's, relative, it's super cheap and shouldn't, uh, you know, per like kernel launch or something like that. So it shouldn't really uh, be a problem. Uh, debugging that's under development uh, as well is essentially extensions to enable Clang debugger to use like Cocos naming information. So you would, for example, not get a message or you had a stack fold at this pointer address, but it would also tell you, oh, this pointer address was previously allocated in a view given this name and uh, the error happened in the kernel called this, you know, whatever the name is you gave for Perl 4. And then the last thing we are looking at is static analysis. Uh, essentially, we are adding a path or a pattern to Clang tidy uh, of what you shouldn't do. And I'll have an example of that in a second. So um, the profiling and debugging, as I said, uh, that's one of the big things we've been working on for a while. Uh, and there's, you know, both a set of really basic tools we have. You know, you just type make and you just check out the tools from GitHub, you type make, and then you can run these tools. Um, and they give you, you know, basic timing information, information about what you use in terms of memory and stuff like that. Uh, you know, if you want to know more, go to the uh, CocosGitHub.com, uh, co uh, you know, uh, organization, go to Cocos Tools and there's a wiki page with documentation. Um, one of the problems we try to solve with that is that abstraction layers obfuscate profile output. So for example, in, in Trinidad, when we run that with NVProf, there was, uh, no, we don't want auto updates right now. Um, there was uh, a situation where we, uh, which we gave to NVIDIA as an example of what, what's going bad, uh, where we had uh, a kernel name, which was like 4,000 characters long. And it turned out that we had 100 kernels where the first 500 characters are all the same. And that just comes from all the templating and all these you know, nested template instantiations, which go into the kernel name eventually. Um, what this allows you to do is we can use these names and pass them on to third party tools. Here in the, in the lower side, there's an example for VTune, uh, where if you named your stuff and you loaded the VTune hook uh, kind of uh, uh, tool, uh, you can go to this uh, frame domain, frame uh, view of your uh, profile in VTune, and then what you will see is you will see something like Perl4.xb, uh, and you know here's the first time you called that, the second time, the third time you called that. Uh, the lowest one is we, we always generate a name based on the type ID and where you had, you know, a type ID uh, for your Lambda was uh, essentially a Lambda in main. So, the important part is you don't need to recompile. Uh, this uses just these runtime hooks and it all happens via setting an environment variable. Uh, we integrate it with more party tools. For example, uh, you know, we've been working with with things like Tau and, um, and also NVVP. Uh, NVIDIA just added to their system, as the end systems version, a thing where, where these, these names now finally show up in their, in their stack. Uh, and here's a Tau, another example you know, from Tau where it, it tells you, you know, oh, there's a com update halo region and within that region, you know, you had these parallel fours with these names. And then it shows you on top of that, you know, the, the, the OpenMP parallel regions uh, telling you, you know, where these regions were coming from, you know, with, uh, with the parallel force and stuff like that. This is an example for a static analysis thing. So in Cocos, you're not allowed to capture by reference uh, technically and then modify, uh, you know, in this nesting scope, uh, a variable from the outer scope. And so this Clang tidy would be able to tell you that, right? Uh, you see that here in the first example that says lambda captures modifies reference. You know, you shouldn't do that. Uh, and uh, you know that's kind of that's kind of you know the stuff we are looking for you know things which technically would compile but violate the semantics of Cocos. Okay, so that was a bit of overview of you know what's part of the Cocos ecosystem, what we are trying to achieve, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now in the last uh, 20 minutes or so here about. Uh, 
what uh, you know what we've been doing with that. So one of the things is we have the Cocos based projects. You know we we got about a dozen or so uh, big codes running real analysis today. So that stuff which runs in production on the on the big platforms. You know running with like thousands of GPUs, etc. Uh, we have you know on the order of like 35 of these uh, you know half million line codes being completely committed to going there, and uh, we're actively porting, but we're not necessarily all in the state yet, you know, to uh, being done, you know, and being able to run their full science that way. Um, whereas, you know, a number, if you go to slightly smaller packages, right, or, or libraries and stuff like that, you know, there's probably like 65, maybe a bit more. And if you count, you know, all the people who do stuff, uh, uh, you know, with Cocos, right, proxy apps or whatever, we're talking, you know, somewhere around 100 to 150 packages uh, is our estimate. Uh, it might be a bit low. Uh, in the end, we had about uh, probably 500, 600 people going through at least the 2D tutorial on Cocos so far. So, uh, you know, if you divide that by typical team sizes per, per team, you know, you probably end up somewhere in that order. There's tons of users on all kinds of places, both here in the US and outside. Here's an example for LAMPS, um, you know, which is a which, which was one of the earliest codes which was adopting Cocos. And um, I mean, what you get here is you get you know roughly what you expect in terms of performance. Uh, uh, one interesting thing is that the Cocos version of LAMPS is actually a bit faster than the vanilla version as the original code of LAMPS. Uh, that is a thing we've seen uh, numerous times, uh, partly because Cocos is a restrictive programming model. It doesn't actually allow you to do all kinds of stuff. And it turns out if you get, if, if you are prevented from reallocating or, you know, your data structures in the middle of your loops, then your code will be faster as a result. Uh, this is Border, that's uh, also a production simulation at scale. Uh, it's a stochastic uh, parallelified gas time accurate analyzer. Essentially, it's a DSMC code, as uh, a direct simulation Monte Carlo code. Uh, this is actually, to the best of my knowledge, the only code which ever ran on Trinity using uh, both partitions, you know, the, the KNL and the Haswell partition at the same time uh, for one big MPI job. So they ran a 20,000 node MPI job um, on there. It was also benchmarked on Sierra with up to 16,000 GPUs and runs in production at about 5,000 GPUs. And for uh, uh, this was one of the codes last year which was using up the most cycles on uh, Sierra apparently. Uh, Uinta is a thing, is a framework, a system-wide tasking framework uh, which comes from the University of Utah and they do some codes there in particular regarding like combustion and radiation simulations. Uh, they had a code which already was working on GPUs and CPUs, and then they started switching over into Cocos. And uh, what happened there is the same as uh, in some sense as in LEMS, just more pronounced. Uh, even the CPU code got over 2x faster uh, through, this, uh, through this effort, and the GPU code later was also faster, and that's all with one shared code base right now, instead of having two code bases. Um, well. Okay, so a lot of you guys are probably interested in what are we doing with the Exascale machine. Uh, so we fully released have like three machines, you know, three kind of Exascale class uh, architectures. Uh, all of them are Cray. At Argon, we are getting the Intel Xeon with Intel XE compute accelerators. Or at Oak Ridge, we get uh, AMD CPUs with AMD GPUs. And at, Cray, at NERSC, uh, with Perl Modern, we're going to get AMD CPUs and video GPUs. And then there's another Cray for El Capitan at uh, Lawrence Livermore, where the internals are still unreleased. So we've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, one of the things is we, as, as I said earlier, we extended the Cocos project to have actual developers at the at the other lab. So we have one and a half FDEs both at Argon and at Oak Ridge in terms of just development resources. Um, We've been working on the HIP backend for AMD uh, with the main development for it happening at Oak Ridge. We're working on the Circle or One API uh, thing for Intel. 
with uh, led by Argon. And then we are also doing OpenMP targets for all of them, uh, which we lead uh, at our side. And obviously, the, for NVIDIA, the CUDA backend is still available. So uh, for the OpenMP target backend, uh, the first compiler, the compiler we are getting best mileage out right now is essentially the Clang mainline compiler. Uh, that's the only compiler we kind of officially support right now. EA, it can actually uh, compile all the stuff we implemented so far. Every other one of these compilers currently ISIS on us, as it has internal compiler errors, uh, which we report back. That includes IBM XL. Uh, and uh, we are working with those guys, you know, on fixing it. Interestingly enough, that is even true for the AMD AOMP. Uh, compiler, even though that should just be like a modified version of the Clang mainline. Uh, we're not quite sure why that fails. Uh, as I said, we are testing that right now, and we have like the basic capabilities kind of uh, working, but the performance is pretty spotty. Um, the HIP backend, uh, that's actually like a restart of a work we did, uh, we've been doing for a long time already. Uh, we actually had a complete backend for AMD working uh, January last year, uh, based on a different programming model they, they had, uh, the, which was kind of C++ AMP based. Uh, and we had it working on, we, we started working on it something like four years ago. Uh, and we finally had everything working, all our internal unit sets were working, and then they told us in March that they would deprecate the programming model and throw that away, and we would need to start over. Uh, so we started over. Uh, as I said, that's work led by Oak Ridge. Um, we have, you know, uh, a number of our basic capabilities are in place right now. Uh, more are coming like every week. Uh, performance is still kind of a bit funky in some places, but not not as bad as with like OpenMP. So the dot product, for example, is, you know, reasonably good, you know, kind of where you would uh, expect it. Uh, the, the vector add here in this case is slower than we would expect. So the, the MI60 actually has more uh, bandwidth than the V100. Uh, but it was confirmed to us by the AMD that they see the exact same problem with just normal, uh, you know, standard HIP code, also even without Cocos in the way. And we are investigating, you know, what's going on there, why we can't get uh, for, you know, a simple vector add the performance they should get. Uh, the worst thing right now is the one API backend. Uh, the biggest problem there is the tools. Um, so um, we, we are working basically not on pure circle because pure circle is, uh, cannot implement Cocos. It also can't implement like C++ 17 algorithms or anything like that. So it's DPC++ we are using. There's all kinds of extensions we essentially need and we're gonna use all of them. Uh, there's weird bugs in the driver, for example, uh, the, the driver for the current test platform uh, thought that all the pointers on my GPU, on my little embedded GPU, are 32-bit. So it essentially threw away 32 bits of our pointers we captured in Lambda, uh, which was kind of weird. Um, so we'll see where this goes. It, we have a couple of capabilities working, but it's you know pretty spotty at this point. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is um, the Coco C++ standard integration cycle. So essentially I said we are working a lot on the C++ standard. And what we are trying to do there is we are trying to get features from, uh, from Cocos into the C++ standard. Oh, I, just for a second, uh, no, there was no new question, so I'm going, gonna go on. Uh, there is a question there right now. <laughs> Um, so open, the OpenMP target uh, backend, in principle, it should, as the, the current OpenMP backend is not because it's OpenMP free, so it only works on CPUs. The OpenMP target backend uh, uh, will, in principle, be portable. We are pretty committed to doing that, as that it will work across all of them. Uh, essentially, we want a second, uh, a second tool chain available on every one of these platforms. Uh, but uh, the the reason the reason that as I mean right now essentially only Clang works, 
uh, all the other compilers crash internally when compiling our testing, our test framework. Uh, so, you know, what can we do? We essentially just report bugs back to the compiler vendors and tell them, uh, you know, here's the reproducer, fix it. And we are trying to fix it. And we'll see how it goes. Okay, back to the C++ standard. Yes. Um, essentially what we do is we propose new features for the C++ standard. What we then do is we actually implement these features when we get accepted in, uh, in the back port to C++ standards we can actually use. So for example, things we propose for C++ 23, we actually have versions which work with C++ 11. And what we then will do is we essentially port the accepted features, uh, you know, to as we, we take our legacy implementation of that and just implement it as a thin wrapper around the, the new version of these capabilities. And what it allows us to do is if you then happen to have a compiler which has that feature already built in, then you can just switch our implementation out for the compiler implementation underneath and everything is fine. Uh, there's a couple of things in works. One of them was the first success was Atomic REST. That's actually in C20. And that provides Atomics with all the capabilities we have for Atomics and Cocos. So you can just uh, reference like a non-atomic allocation and then do atomic operations on top of that. And that even works for things which are not natively supported in the hardware, even for arbitrary sizes. So things like, uh, you know, uh, atomics on STUD complex, for example, should work. The next thing we're working on is Cocos View for STUD MD span that essentially gives you those multi-dimensional arrays of layouts and everything on all these other things. Uh, it's pretty cool. It can basically, we can basically do anything in there we could do with Cocos Views. Uh, but the design is much better, so it will be easier to write your custom layouts. Also, it's arbitrary rank, uh, so it's not just rank 8, like in Cocos views, uh, you can actually make it uh, arbitrary rank, I mean, until your compiler crashes because, uh, you know, of inline death or something like that. Uh, and we are hoping right now that we land that early in the cycle for C++23, potentially at the next meeting. There's a production reference implementation available of that thing in the Cocos organization. Um, the other thing here is the, uh, uh, what we're working for is we work on executors. That's the parallel execution in C++ and then basic linear algebra. That is actually a really cool proposal. We are really proud of that. Uh, and it will support like mixed precision. It will support layout awareness. It will support uh, things like um, uh, batched linear algebra, etc. Okay, uh, last thing before I'm done here. Uh, Features which are currently, you know, in the works or, or, or just made it into 3.0 is, uh, in 3.0 is the full CMake build system with uh, potentially also with like spec. Uh, the spec stuff is something we are still working on, but the pure CMake, you know, with modern CMake uh, kind of works now. So you do find package Cocos, you add your library and then you say target link libraries or, you know, you add their executable and do like target link libraries uh, and just point to Cocos and everything is fine. Uh, we have SIMD types coming up. Uh, that's in the Cocos organization under SIMD math right now, but we're going to move that into Cocos core relatively soon. Uh, that's an experimental capability, but that will give you portable SIMD, op, uh, SIMD types uh, even for GPUs. We are working on things like CUDA graph support, uh, when these resilience and remote spaces, and another thing which is uh, coming is because we had a couple of applications asking for this, uh, we wanted memory pools. And we're going to use, uh, we're going to put like Livermore's umpire library underneath uh, some of our memory spaces. Oh, the zip blast is still private. Yeah, I might not have clicked it uh, public yet. I'll click it public uh, later this week. Okay. Um, here's more information. So you can go to github.com cocos. There's, you know, all the uh, repositories. Uh, you can find all kinds of talks, even if you go to YouTube and look for Cocos, you find all kinds of talks, recorded talks from us. And then uh, if you have questions, join our Slack channel, cocosteam.slack.com. If, if you have registered with Slack with your DOE address, uh, you know, like national lab address or something like that, then you are, should be able to just join. Uh, those are all whitelisted. And with that, I'm pretty much done, and we have like five minutes left for questions. Uh, there is one coming in right now. <laughs> C can you read that question, or uh, please? 
question. Oh, yeah. Okay, can someone outside the listed organizations join with Slack channel? Uh, in principle, yes, but we can also add, uh, so I've also been adding new organizations where, like in particular universities, I usually just add the university domain to it. Um, can Cocos be used for porting existing applications implemented in C++ and also in Fortran? Uh, that is what we are doing, right? Uh, the number of uh, the number of applications which are written from scratch new in Cocos is super low. It's almost always, uh, you know, porting existing uh, uh, existing applications, and often also with like Fortran stuff. In particular, Los Alamos has been doing that a lot. And we have this interoperability library, which allows you to like see Fortran allocations in C++ as Cocos views and vice versa and stuff like that to make that easier. Um, how does the integration of the umpire library looks like in Cocos? Uh, we have some prototype stuff uh, uh, internally for this already. Basically, it will be exposed as its own memory space. In fact, it will be exposed as like a templated memory space. You know, like how the uh, umpire has these different kind of, you know, allocators and stuff like that. So there will be essentially an umpire memory space templated on the kind of allocator type from umpire you want to use. Um, does Cocos provide Mac GPU support for Mac OS 10.14 and higher? <laughs> uh, you mean for NVIDIA GPUs? I don't know. Are there still Macs with NVIDIA GPUs? Uh, we definitely don't have like OpenCL support or anything like that. Uh, but, um, and we don't have OpenCL support because you know there is no C++ OpenCL really supported by anybody. Um, so and we don't have we we have not tested as we are not internally testing NVIDIA GPUs on Macs as on older Macs. Uh, I know that some people have done that and it worked, uh, so we'll see. If there's another question coming in. Yeah. Is there a plan to support multi-streaming for CUDA with Cocos? So CUDA stream support is actually already in there. Uh, what we don't support currently is uh, multiple GPUs within the same process. But uh, CUDA stream support is actually relatively new and that's in there. Right now, it's, it's mostly an interoperability thing, so you still have to create the stream because we haven't, uh, we haven't yet uh, done the, uh, the generic interface to essentially kind of split, uh, split devices. Okay. Uh, it is not clear to me how at what level uh, Cocos integrates with MPI. So Cocos integrates with MPI essentially the same way as CUDA or OpenMP integrates with MPI. That means, uh, you know, from some perspective, not at all, from some perspective, you know, totally fine. So the way we do that is we, uh, uh, we would essentially just extract, you know, pointers from uh, contiguous views and pass these pointers to MPI operations. And you know, depending on whether your MPI is, for example, GPU aware or not, you need to do the deep copy, you know, first. So you copy from like a device view to a host view, and then you pass it pass it on. Uh, no, we don't. No, we uh, Cocos itself doesn't support like uh, distributed objects natively or something like that, right? You can build these things on top of it, like Trillinos builds these things on top of it, you know, like uh, it's uh, distributed matrices and whatnot, but Cocos itself doesn't. What Cocos will do though relatively soon is the PGAS uh, models, right? Which means you could get like distributed uh, allocations, uh, like global arrays. You know, how the performance looks across the whole cluster, uh, you know, that going to be, uh, that's going to be, you know, to be seen. Where it does work really well is on things like NVLink connected boxes like DGX2s. You know, that's something where going to a complete PGAS model like Global Arrays actually works really well. 
Okay, I think that's about it for the questions. Uh, Ashley, could you give me the um, presentation, presenter view, please? Coming your way. All right, so I'd like to share my screen here to uh, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Thank you, Christian, for uh, this nice webinar. So, uh, so we would like to improve, to keep improving the series. So please give us feedback through that survey, the link you have there. So the slides and recording will be available at those two links there, but some next week, week from today. Uh, I'd like to announce the next webinar that's going to be a month down the road, testing strategies when learning programming models and using high performance libraries. And that webinar is going to be presented by Balint Drew from the Jefferson Lab. And we have already uh, the registration open for, um, for that webinar in March. Thank you all again. Do we have any final uh, 